Good evening and welcome. I'm Vanessa Hoffman, Program Coordinator for Research and Education at the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network, Beacon. Tonight we present Stages, Grades, and Pathology, the second webinar in our winter series on diagnosing bladder cancer. I'd like to do some quick housekeeping first. Take a look at the left side of the screen for instructions on how to listen in on the webinar. You should see a pop-up window that says audio broadcast. If you don't see that, I'd recommend closing the webinar window and logging on again. You can listen using your phone by looking at the phone icon in the top right of your screen in the participants box. There's also a phone number for WebEx tech support um, on the left side of your screen. You should see a question and answer box on the bottom right of your screen. Please type in questions as you think of them. We will be answering questions at the end of the webinar, but you can also type them as you think of them. Um, next, I'd like to introduce our speakers. Dr. Donna Hansel is Associate Professor of Pathology and Lab Medicine at the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio. However, she will be assuming a new role at the beginning of April as Director of Anatomic Pathology at the University of California, San Diego. She is certified by the American Board of Pathology and Anatomic Pathology. Her laboratory research focuses on the development of new therapies for patients with bladder cancer. Her research results have been presented nationally and internationally and have resulted in over 60 peer-reviewed publications. Our second speaker tonight is Dr. Trinity Bivlacqua. He is Associate Professor of Urology and Oncology at the James Buchanan Brady Urological Institute at Johns Hopkins. He has a special interest in bladder and prostate cancer with an emphasis on organ sparing therapies and minimally invasive techniques. A major focus of his research lab is to develop new molecular-based targeted therapies for bladder cancer. He has been recognized for his research accomplishments with several grants, including a Career Development Award from the National Health Institute and the American Urological Association Rising Star Award. Each presenter will speak for approximately 10 to 15 minutes, and then we will take questions at the end for about 15 minutes. So let's get started with Donna Hansel. Hi, Vanessa, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so thank you all for attending. Um, today I'll be talking about pathology in um, bladder cancer grading and staging. Um, what I wanted to do to start off with, because a lot of people are not familiar with the field of pathology, is to give a little bit of an overview of what we do. Uh, so typically when, uh, when patients come in, you, you usually will see your urologist first, um, who will do cystoscopy, evaluate you clinically, um, and a subset of cases um, are recommended to either undergo biopsy, transurethral resection, or surgery. Um, once that, what we call a specimen or your tissue sample comes out, uh, that's the point at which pathology steps in. And we do a couple of different steps along the way. We first uh, what do what we do is called a gross evaluation. So we take a look at the specimen. Uh, we describe what we see. If it's a small biopsy, we describe it as such. If it's a bigger surgery where the bladder is out, uh, we carefully dissect it. We look for margins. Um, we look to see how big the tumor is, for example. Uh, the next step is to use our microscope and to really take a look at the microscopic molecular level at what cell types are there, uh, how deeply the cells invade, which is what we call staging, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, as well as potentially do some additional testing, um, meaning things like immunohistochemistry, uh, genetic testing, et cetera. And once we're done with all of that, we have a very good idea of what the tumor actually is, and we write this all up as a pathology report, and this goes back to your urologist or oncologist who then will have another appointment with you and really kind of go through what that report says. Um, and I was just going to show you some examples along the way of what, um, what we do. So this slide talks a little bit about what we call the gross analysis or examination, which is really where we just look at the tissue that comes to us by eye. So this is before we use the uh, microscope. Um, and, uh, and I see a question has popped up, and I'll, I'll get to that after this slide. Um, 
so when we do growth analysis, we really take a look at the tissue by eye. We describe what's present, meaning the weight, the dimensions, meaning how many centimeters in each direction. You know, if we see a tumor that's present, we um, describe how big the tumor is, what it looks like. Uh, we then section through the specimen and we say, you know, this is a tumor. It looks like it's invading into the wall. This is to us how deeply it looks like it's invading. And then we cut little small pieces of this tumor out. Uh, we put it into little plastic cassettes. We fix it with a preservative. And then uh, it goes to the laboratory where flies are cut, you know, very thin flies. They're stained in a special way. And then we um, are able to take this and look at it under a microscope. Um, and I see the question is, what would you do with following histology? Um, and I think if I understand the, the question correctly, uh, this is where um, histology is really where the tissue gets processed and gets put onto slides. And, you know, once we have the slides, we look under the microscope and generate a report. Um, and that's what goes back to the urologist. Um, if, if I haven't answered the question, um, please pop up another. Um, it may be answered in the next couple of slides. So when the slides get processed um, and we look at them under the microscope, and this is typically what we see. Um, so this is a really high resolution picture of the bladder wall. Uh, the top central picture here is really the uh, where you have the where the urine is stored on the top of the bladder, and we see what's called the urethelium, or the tissue lining of the bladder wall. And we take a look to see how normal or abnormal this looks. Um, and then we describe the various subtypes if we see an invasive tumor. And talking about the invasive subtypes, we can do more as a question and answer part. Um, but I did want to raise um, that spectrum of diagnoses here, just in case um, uh, just in case people have uh, questions about this later. So typically we have uh, urothelial cell carcinoma, uh, which is on the far left of the screen. Um, we can have squamous cell carcinoma, we can have adenocarcinoma, and we can have small cell carcinoma. And those are really the, the four major types of bladder cancer. And then there are numerous other subtypes of that. So part of what we do as pathologists is to really say what type of bladder cancer um, is present. And, you know, if we have any question um, as to the diagnosis, there are some special studies we can do. Um, and a lot of times these studies are called immunohistochemistry. Um, and this really has a number of different, what, what we use are called antibodies. And sometimes you might see in your report that stains were done for cytokeratin such as cytokeratin 7 and 20, P63, um, CD44, P53. And a lot of times uh, these stains um, these are used to either help us make sure that the tumor is coming from the bladder, um, or it can be used in a couple of cases where, you know, early on in the course of disease where we try to figure out is this really – uh, a tumor that's starting to arise in the bladder on the surface. And those are really the two main areas where we use uh, these immunostains. Um, and I see the, uh, that there is a question, infiltrating high-grade urothelial carcinoma with extensive glandular differentiation and areas suspicious for angiolymphatic invasion, carcinoma, and cytokine signet ring carcinoma. So that's exactly correct. Those are some of the variants that we see. Um, and we also look for vascular invasion or angiolymphatic invasion, which is where the tumor cells go into the um, blood vessels. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about muscular is appropriate and not present. That's actually in a slide coming up. Um, and then there's a question about sarcomatoid bladder cancer. And I'm going to go back to the variants at the end of the um, presentation. And, and we may go back to that actually during the question and answer uh, period. Uh, so the next slide that I put up is a sample surgical pathology report. And this is along the lines of what I think most of you as patients may have seen. Um, so it describes what uh, the urologist thinks um, was present. So in this case, it was bladder tumor. Sometimes there's more description with it. 
there's usually what the clinician thinks is a preoperative diagnosis. There's usually a procedure that's listed. Um, in this case, it's cystoscopy, transurethral resection. Um, there's a section that typically has a gross examination, which is, remember, what I said, this is what we do when we look at it just with the eye before we start cutting up the specimen. So this is really the description of what we see that is coming from the operating room. Uh, sometimes there's a microscopic diagnosis. Uh, more and more, we're actually not putting that into reports um, because there's a lot of consensus as to what goes into that. And then there's always a final diagnosis. And in the final diagnosis, this is really where you have your diagnosis of whether a tumor is present, the grade of the tumor, which we'll talk about in a minute, the stage of the tumor, um, which we'll talk about, meaning how far it's, uh, it's evaded into the wall, whether or not blood vessels are involved, um, if there are any other findings, so if it looks like there's an infection in addition to the tumor, that gets reported. And then at the very end, we put a stage, what's called a pathologic stage. And there are three parts of that. There's the PT, which is the tumor uh, stage, meaning this is typically um, a measure of how invasive this is. Um, there's an end stage, which is whether or not there are metastases to the lymph nodes. And there's an M stage, which is metastasis. And in many cases, this ends up being an X, um, because oftentimes this is an advanced disease. Uh, let me see, I'm just briefly scrolling through the questions as well. Okay, I'll, um, I see someone said, please repeat the questions. When we get to the end, I'm actually going to go through um, the specific questions, and we're having a lot dealing with uh, variants. Hi, Donna. Okay. Sorry, it's Vanessa. Yeah. We're going to try to take most of the questions at the end of the webinar just so we can say them okay. out loud and everyone can hear. Okay. So thank you. Okay. Okay, thanks. So just a, few, just a few slides on the grading of bladder cancer. Um, and grading is really uh, primarily applied to the non-invasive lesions. And this could be diagnoses where you get um, a diagnosis that says non-invasive low-grade papillary urothelial carcinoma, non-invasive high-grade urothelial carcinoma, flat urothelial carcinoma in situ, which is considered a high-grade variant. Um, and then once we get actually into the invasive disease, we really consider all of those to be high grade. And um, really the, dis the most important distinction with grading is in that non-invasive component before it invades. Um, there's a number of criteria we use, and you know, I've listed kind of some of the uh, descriptors in the top line. And really we're just looking to see how different these cells look from what we know the normal urothelium looks like. And we look at all sorts of things. We look at shape and size, and is it darker? Um, you know, this, do the cells look like they're dividing? Have they lost organization? Um, and we really, in a very somewhat subjective way, um, really take a look at all of this information, assimilate it, and then render a diagnosis of low grade or high grade. And you know, part of the problem with this is that there, there are sometimes subtle changes there is subjectivity, even though we feel we come up with good criteria, um, a lot of times this is dependent on the experience of the pathologist, especially in cases that are more challenging. Um, you know, Trinity will probably talk about this more, but when we talk about low-grade non-invasive bladder tumors, these we often see recurring and remaining low-grade, although we know that some can go on to be high-grade. Um, we worry more when we have a diagnosis of high-grade disease, meaning high-grade non-invasive papillary, flat urothelial carcinoma in situ, because we do know that there is a much higher risk of developing invasion um, and more aggressive disease if we don't treat that. Um, I put at the very bottom kind of the spectrum of the four entities uh, that we typically consider, you know, in the grading spectrum for non-invasive disease. Um, and most of you probably have not seen the first two entities in your report. They're very uncommon, uh, but we do view both papilloma and what we call a pun lump, P-U-N-L-M-P, at the very low end of bladder neoplasia. Uh, the low-grade papillary urothelial carcinoma 
that I talked about tends to recur, but often does not invade, although we know it can progress. And then the high grade papillary urothelial carcinoma or flat urothelial carcinoma in situ. And again, all the tumors that invade now we consider to be high grade tumors. And this is just a picture to show you a comparison on the left and just to show you a little bit some of the subjectivity. Um, so on the left is what we consider low grade and on the right we consider um, more high grade. And on the right hand side, even though um, you know, I, I think when you look, you can see that there's a difference. And, you know, typically the cells look a little bit darker. There's more variability. Um, it's not as neatly organized. And these are all the sorts of features that we take into account to render a diagnosis of high grade. And in many cases, um, you know, whether we call something low grade or high grade really does correlate with changes in the genes um, and the DNA that is present within these tumors. So even though there is subjectivity, um, there is a pretty good correlation uh, between what we know um, changes at the DNA level. Uh, I just put one slide here about invasive just to recapitulate that once we find invasion, meaning the tumor cells go below the surface lining of the bladder, that we really consider these to all be high-grade lesions. And just in case anyone on the phone has had this diagnosis, which we see occasionally, um, what has been called in the past low-grade papillary carcinoma um, with invasion, we know now that these are really all high-grade lesions. So we really define grading and some, sometimes based on the behavior of these tumors. And there are a lot of challenges. So. Um, you know, I told you when we get the tissue, it comes and we look at it, we evaluate it, and we process it, and we put it under a microscope. Well, sometimes, you know, in the spectrum from when you actually take the sample in the urology suite to when we get it on the glass slide, um, you know, things can go wrong. And, um, you know, sometimes things go wrong in the lab. Sometimes the specimen wasn't taken always correctly in the operating room. And so sometimes we have challenges when those sorts of problems come up, and we call those artifacts. And sometimes you may see in your report that there is cautery artifacts, fixation artifacts, and that just means that there are some problems. You know, it, it's almost like, you know, you had a drawing and someone spilled water on it, and you can't really interpret what was underneath with as much clarity. And so anything that distorts what we're able to see, we consider an artifact. And the other uh, major point just to be mentioned is that, you know, the skill level and experience of the pathologist really does make a difference. Um, and again, this is, you know, in some ways like art appreciation. Um, you know, the more you study this, the more you're able to recognize certain artists who do paintings. Um, and some people are better at that than others. And that's exactly what we do as pathologists. We look at a picture under the microscope and we use our experience and judgment to, as well as some criteria that, that we feel are reliable, to really assign a grade. Um, but sometimes this can be difficult. And sometimes this is when, you know, cases get sent around to different people. You may get different opinions, and that's why. Um, the last couple of slides, I just wanted to touch on staging. Uh, so here, this is a whole section through the bladder wall. Uh, the very top, where it's all white, is where um, in an intact bladder where the urine would sit. And this little tiny strip where I have listed TATIF urethelium, that's the what we call the urethelium lining. So that's the epithelium. That's where any bladder tumor will arise. It will come out of this uh, surface lining. And then when you go below that, we have a bunch of connective tissue. Uh, we have blood vessels that are present. And when you go further down, um, you can see what's called muscular expropriate detrusor muscle at the very bottom. And this is that big, thick muscle bundle that's around the wall. Um, and then what's off this picture is some stats below that, and then you have other organs surrounding it. And when we look at invasion, uh, we basically go from the top of this slide through to the bottom. And we look to see what structures are present around the invasive tumor. And depending on how deep it goes, um, we assign it a stage. And I have the stages listed on the right-hand side of, this, of uh, the picture. And you can see uh, TATIF means non-invasive high-grade disease. 
is where the tumors invade into the blood vessels and loose tissue right below. And as the tumor keeps invading further and further into the wall, you get to the muscle layer, and that becomes T2 disease. And if it goes past that into the fat, it's considered T3 disease. So when you see that uh, staging at the very bottom, it really refers to the depth, this anatomic depth through the bladder wall where the tumor goes. And this is just to show a few pictures of, you know, an example of what we would see as pathologists going from non-invasive disease where everything is contained uh, to invasion into the lamina propria where you can see the, the white area where the urine usually is, what the epithelial layer is, and then a whole bunch of cells below that. So it's lamina propria invasion. And then it keeps going. So then we have large muscle bundles of detrusor muscle invasion. And then um, another thing we do as pathologists is to look at lymph nodes when they come out and see whether or not tumor is present in the lymph nodes. And there are some, some challenges with the staging. Uh, so whenever we do biopsies or transurethral resections, just based on the anatomy and the small pieces we get, the most that we can ever say is that this is invasion into the muscle. And that's as deep as we can go. Um, and having the muscle present on these biopsies and transurethral resections is really important because when it's not present, you know, there there's absolutely no way as pathologists that we can uh, look at the slide and know how extensively this tumor is invading. And oftentimes the urologist will make the decision whether or not to take the bladder out based on whether or not that muscle is involved by invasive tumor. So in the cases when we don't see any muscle in the background, we really make a big deal about that in the report. We say the muscle is not present, and many times the urologist will go back and re-sample. Um, and the, the take-home points, and this will be my last slide, alternative or to Trinity, um, is that, you know, pathologists are physicians that really, you know, analyze the tissue from the time it leaves the operating room and goes all the way until the point that a medical report is generated and goes back to the urologist. So there are multiple steps in there. Uh, you know, typically we work very closely with urologists and oncologists to make sure that you know, everything we can do as far as patient diagnosis and staging is done appropriately and with as much information as possible. Uh, certainly if there are problems, we always um, bring that to attention so that we can really make the report as accurate as possible. Uh, you know, more and more patients are able to receive copies of their report, and it's really important if you have questions about what's in those reports to really ask either your urologist or to call the pathologist who, you know, is more than willing in those cases to speak with the patient and explain. Um, and, you know, I will say that more and more with the bladder, we're actually doing special markers. Um, and I anticipate that more and more you'll see some of these special studies, the immunohistochemistry, the gene test being reported in this disease. And that is it for my part of the talk. I'll turn it over to Trinity, and then I believe at the very end of this, we'll, we'll do the question and answer. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Hansel. Now I'm going to um, turn things over to um, Dr. Bivilacqua. Thanks, Donna. Thanks, Vanessa. Um, can you guys hear me? I'm trans Okay. You should be able to advance your slides now. Okay, great. Um, what I'll do is I'll spend a little bit of time uh, going over uh, kind of what uh, what a urologist uh, how, how what a urologist um, needs to do in order to uh, help you uh, determine the best treatment for your bladder cancer, but more importantly to emphasize on um, a lot of what Donna just went over, which is the um, final pathological analysis and and how we take that into account for management of your bladder cancer. There's going to be a lot of different uh, webinars in the, in the next coming months, so it'll go over all the specifics of this. But I think I'll try to, in the next 15 minutes, introduce the topic and give you a good background so um, uh, it will help you um, kind of steer through uh, treatment of your bladder cancer. 
So in this first slide, um, I, I'd like to start off with just a little bit of history because this is really a landmark observation that was made by Jewett and Strong in 1946. If you think about it, that was only you know 50, 60 years ago that we were uh, learning uh, the different stages of bladder cancer. And what Jewett uh, demonstrated is that with increasing um, a depth of invasion of uh, tumors, you had uh, a higher risk of regional and distant metastasis. And this was the first observation and ultimately was the basis of all staging of bladder cancer. Obviously now we have uh, a, a lot more um, uh, elegant ways of uh, determining the pathological stage and Donna just went over all of the various ways that our GU pathologists really assist us in determining the appropriate stage of, uh, of bladder cancer so we could come up with the best treatment option. Here you can see just a summary of, uh, of the various stages, which we just heard about. And in particular, I'll point out that you have carcinoma in situ, which is a flat lesion that lies on the urothelial lining of the bladder. Um, one thing that uh, a lot of patients will oftentimes um, ask is, 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 this a, uh, is this cancer, is this a low-grade or high-grade lesion? And just understand that this is a very aggressive and high-grade lesion that, that needs to be treated uh, in that way. We can have superficial or non-invasive tumors, which are, uh, which are uh, staged as TA. T1 is when we start to see invasion into that connective tissue right underneath the urothelial lining. And then we, and then we see more uh, depth of invasion or deeper muscle invasion, which is the T2 and uh, A or T2B, which is uh, the, our way of uh, being able to distinguish the ultimate depth of invasion. T3 and T4 lesions is when we start to see invasion outside of the bladder into the fat surrounding the bladder, and then T4 lesions are when they start to uh, grow into adjacent organs. Uh, if a man, that could be the prostate, and a female, that could be the side walls or actually uh, the uterus, um, uh, which is in uh, close proximity. The best way to, dis to stratify bladder cancer is in, uh, as either non-muscle invasive or muscle invasive disease. As we just heard, you can stratify into low-grade tumors, high-grade tumors as it relates to the non-muscle invasive disease. This is where the lesions are confined to either the, the urothelial lining or the lamina propria or the connective tissue. So this would be TA or T1 disease, um, and, and, and we actually consider T1 disease as an invasive lesion, but we don't necessarily treat it with a cystectomy up front. Muscle invasive disease is where we have uh, patients that will present with d uh, deep muscle invasion into the deep uh, detrusor muscle, as we just heard. Um, and this can be either localized, which means uh, local to the pelvis uh, or bladder, or can present with distant metastatic disease. And these, this will ultimately be a focus of, uh, of uh, future webinars as to how to treat this. I think the best way to think about urothelial cancer is, uh, is to kind of describe it as two separate phenotypes. When we look at this at a, both a genetic level and a molecular level, these types of tumors will behave differently. And these are some just things to remember, that patients that have non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, the majority of these uh, patients, um, uh, majority of bladder cancer patients will actually present with non-muscle invasive disease. Upwards of 70 to 80 percent of people that have bladder cancer will start with non-muscle invasive disease. Um, patients that uh, will have high-grade lesions that are non-muscle invasive, 50 to 80 percent of those patients may have actually ultimate um, uh, a recurrence of their disease. And the mainstay treatment of non-muscle invasive disease is transurethral resection of the bladder tumor with pathological analysis and then ultimately intravesical therapy with either chemotherapy or immunotherapy, and the mainstay there is BCG. 20 to 30 percent of patients will actually present with muscle invasive disease. Um, 15 percent of patients with muscle invasive disease will have a prior history of non-muscle invasive disease and 80 to 90 percent are our primary muscle invasive urothelial carcinoma um, will, will ultimately present uh, with their disease as depth of invasion into the deep muscle. And as we just heard, all patients that have um, uh, muscle invasive disease, they're practically all high grade. When we look at recurrence rates with non-muscle invasive disease, 
uh, urothelial papilloma are at the lowest risk of recurrence. These patients, or we know that papilloma, patients with papilloma um, will uh, have uh, no progression. What I mean by that is patients that have um, this type of uh, uh, urothelial um, uh, uh, lesion uh, will not have progression into muscle invasion. If you, as we heard, uh, a pun lump or a papillary urothelial neoplasm of low malignant potential. The risk of recurrence is actually um, a, is a high range here, but ultimately there is a very little risk of progression into the high, uh, into low grade lesions or high grade lesions. And here we see patients with low grade urothelial carcinoma. Recurrence rates are high, however, progression rate is low. It's not until we start to see the high-grade lesions that recurrence rates are, are, are very high, upwards of 70%, with uh, ranging between um, uh, high ranges between 25 to 65% progression to muscle invasive disease. What I will say is, is that carcinoma in situ, as I stated earlier, is, high gra is a high-grade lesion and represents um, uh, an aggressive disease with risk of um, progression. How do we treat non-muscle invasive bladder cancer? If you had uh, a non-muscle invasive a disease that is low grade, well, this can sometimes be managed with serial cystoscopies, which is where we place a scope inside of the bladder in, in the office, and we, and we monitor for um, recurrence. No, th no further therapy is, is oftentimes needed in patients that have low-grade lesions. As I stated earlier, these patients are at very little risk of progression, and therefore, ultimately, um, uh, surveillance with cystoscopy is the only thing that's needed. However, if you were to develop multiple tumors um, with multiple low-grade lesions and they continue to recur, it's at that point that we then recommend intravesical therapy using either chemotherapy or immunotherapy, which I'll talk about in a minute. It's the high-grade lesions, or the, um, such as high-grade urothelial carcinoma, that have a high propensity for recurrence, progression into muscle invasion, and that's when we treat these uh, patients very aggressively with intravesical therapy. If we look at the National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines, the NCC guidelines, we see here that uh, treatment for low-grade TA lesions, TA lesions are the lesions that are confined to the urothelial lining of the, um, uh, of the bladder. As, we, if, as you remember Donna's um, uh, nice uh, diagram, the histology, that's the very top of, the, um, of, of her uh, histological um, uh, uh, schematic. Low-grade lesions are, are treated with um, either observation, and if the urologist believes that they are seeing a low-grade lesion, a single installation of um, mitomycin C after, an, after the transurethral resection of the bladder tumor has been shown to reduce recurrence rates. However, that is up to the urologist to make that decision at the time of transurethral resection. And I will tell you that oftentimes we don't know if this is a high-grade lesion or a low-grade lesion, and there are ultimately it's our decision as to the risk-benefit with uh, installation of mitomycin C after a resection of the tumor. And I'll talk about that briefly in a minute. It's the TA lesions that are high grade. If, you're, if the pathologist sends us a, a uh, pathology report that shows a non-invasive high grade lesion and there's no deep muscle in the specimen, it's at that point that we do not know the stage of the disease. And, and the concern here is, is that there may be residual disease present. So we will perform a repeat transurethral resection of bladder tumor or a restaging transurethral resection. Um, and at that point, if, the, the, if there is um, still a re residual tumor, which is high grade, or, it, or it, there is no residual tumor, we ultimately will recommend BCG, which is the preferred treatment for patients with high grade disease. If a patient has, has T1 disease, which is either low grade or high grade, a restaging transurethral through a section of bladder tumor is the, is the preferred treatment at that point. The purpose of doing a restaging transurethral through a section of bladder tumor is to, one, determine the appropriate stage and to, re and to remove any residual disease before intravesical therapy is initiated. If a patient has multiple tumors that are high grade, have evidence of lymphovascular invasion, which means the tumor is invading the lymphatic systems, and there is high volume disease, 
Urologists will oftentimes recommend cystectomy or removal of the bladder for concerns that this is a very aggressive tumor with a, with, with, and the patient is at high risk of spread. So removing, removing the bladder at that time will be more a more definitive treatment than local intravesical therapy. If a patient has carcinoma in situ, once again, a high-grade lesion, BCG is the mainstay treatment um, as the first-line therapy. So why do we perform a restaging TURBT? This is oftentimes preferred, performed approximately a month, two to three to four weeks after your initial resection. We do this because we know that 20 to 30% of the time, there may, may be an upstaging. So if you were found to have a, a TA lesion or non-muscle invasive lesion at the time of, uh, of restaging TURBT, you may be found to be upstaged to T1 lesion or laminar appropriate invasion, or, by, or possibly if you had a T1 lesion, you could be upstaged to T2 lesion or muscle invasive disease. And as, and as you will hear shortly, the treatment of a T1 lesion versus a T2 lesion is vastly different. And the other reason why we perform a transurethral resection of a bladder tumor is, is in hopes to be able to rid the bladder of all residual disease so intravesical therapy is more effective. Once again, looking at the NCCA guideline principles for intravesical therapy, immediate intravesical chemotherapy at the time of resection of your tumor is only recommended if the urologist believes that they're dealing with a non-invasive low-grade lesion. Why do we do this? Because it has been shown that mitomycin C, given at the time of transurethral resection, and once again, mitomycin C is a chemotherapy, can reduce recurrence rates. However, if the patient has a suspected bladder perforation or thinning of the bladder wall, or there is bleeding present, then this is contraindicated, and therefore, intravesical um, mitomycin C is not administered. If a patient is, uh, is given the diagnosis of a high-grade lesion, there are options between chemotherapy or immunotherapy, um, and this is oftentimes started approximately one month after the resection, and we'll go over that shortly. So how do we manage non-muscle invasive bladder cancer? Well, as I stated earlier, if someone has a, a, a non-invasive superficial lesion that is low-grade, we can oftentimes manage this with endoscopic evaluation. However, if you are found to have carcinoma in situ or a high-grade TA or T1 lesion, then intravesical therapy in the form of immunotherapy, either alone using BCG, combined with BCG with interferon, chemotherapy such as mitomycin C, gemcitabine, Valstar, or valrubicin, are our first-line treatments, as well as second-line treatments in patients that have failed BCG. I put here an asterisk for a clinical trial because there are a number of clinical trials that are currently um, available to patients uh, that have BCG refractory or BCG um, resistant disease. And that is oftentimes what uh, we recommend to patients that are not willing to undergo cystectomy that are, that are still failing in intravesical therapy. So here are examples of intravesical agents that have been used um, in, in the past for the treatment of uh, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. I would tell you that the mainstay treatment um, is that is BCG for p patients that have carcinoma in situ or high-grade lesions. Mitomycin C is, an, is, is our other um, sort of mainstay for chemotherapy with patients that have high-grade lesions. We combine BCG with interferon when, um, when uh, patients have failed um, uh, BCG alone. And once again, valrubicin is used as our only FDA-approved um, uh, treatment for patients that have carcinoma in situ, which is resistant or refractory to BCG. So what is the principles and why do we choose BCG? Well, back, um, it, it, as, as you probably are all well aware, it's a, it, the BCG is an attenuated mycobacterium, um, which is a live attenuated um, uh, form of uh, TB. It, the, the reason why this is used is because it has anti-tumor activity. It's been shown to, um, to inhibit or reduce the growth of uh, urothelial cells in vitro, and this was um, given intravesically, which means into the bladder, um, uh, in the 1970s and found to be very effective. 
Here is just a slide that goes over sort of the, the actual percentage or recurrence rates uh, with patients that have um, carcinoma in situ and BCG. And I'll, and I'll, for the purposes of time, I'll keep on moving because this will be an ultimate focus of a number of um, uh, future um, uh, webinars uh, with this. We oftentimes hear about maintenance BCG. Um, if a patient has been given an induction course of BCG, which means six uh, installations over six weeks, they have a durable response, which means they have no evidence of a disease on a repeat cystoscopy and biopsy. We then put them on an induction course of uh, BCG, which is th three weekly installations at the time point seen here. And what this has been shown on in the uh, on a number of uh, large uh, trials by the Southwest Oncology Group that this actually reduces recurrence rates. However, it has no effect on progression. So what it has been shown to reduce recurrence, but no changes in progression. And what I will tell you is most patients that are started on a maintenance course oftentimes cannot tolerate this for upwards of 36 months due to the effects of um, local effects of BCG. Mitomycin C, once again, used um, in uh, patients that have high-grade lesions and, uh, and, and, need, and uh, need intravesical therapy. I, I think the, this is oftentimes used in, in either six to eight weeks. It is given in multiple doses and sometimes dose escalated. Uh, the optimization of this, and this is something that, that all patients uh, who get this have to remember to re eliminate residual urine prior to installation. They have to have an overnight fasting. They have to, oftentimes we use medications such as sodium bicarbonate, which reduce the, uh, which cause alkalization of the urine, which allow the drug to be more, um, uh, more absorbed into the lining of the bladder, and this has been shown to be more effective. This is oftentimes used in patients that have multifocal low-grade lesions, and in a number of meta-analysis has been shown actually to be very comparable to BCG. Here we see um, uh, examples of, uh, once again, guidelines for the NCCN for post-treatment or recurrent disease after someone has failed um, uh, uh, various intravesical therapies. Here you can see if a patient is found to have a tumor after uh, be, uh, intravesical therapy, TURBT is the mainstay treatment, followed by uh, um, adjuvant therapies as needed. If a patient has recurrent disease um, uh, and after BCG, TURBT is performed, and if there is, if there is no residual disease there, the patient can be put on maintenance BCG. If there is residual carcinoma in situ or non-invasive disease, we oftentimes will change the, the intravesical agent or recommend cystectomy if this is recurrent disease uh, on multiple occasions. And if someone has progression to T1 disease after uh, receiving BCG or mitomycin after two consecutive cycles or induction courses, um, this is considered complete failure and we recommend cystectomy at that time. Here are uh, our guidelines for muscle invasive disease, and uh, for, uh, because our time is running short, I just will say that uh, in, for the treatment of muscle invasive bladder cancer, surgical management is, is the mainstay treatment. If there is no evidence of local or regional metastasis or spread or distant spread, this is, uh, nowadays, uh, I would tell you that I believe, and often, uh, the, and, and the most authorities in the field, recommend neoadjuvant chemotherapy prior to cystectomy. And the purpose of using systemic chemotherapy prior to removal of the bladder is because there is strong evidence to suggest that we can influence overall survival and reduce um, and reduce uh, spread or metastasis. And this is just an example of a pooled analysis of a, of a, a meta-analysis of the various um, uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy trials which show an improvement in overall, just survi uh, overall survival and disease-specific survival in patients that have undergone systemic chemotherapy prior to cystectomy. And Vanessa, I think I'll stop there because I, I believe that, um, that we're running short of time in order to get some questions. I, I, we'll, we'll stop at that point. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Bivilacqua, Dr. Hansel. Um, just so everyone knows, um, this webinar is being recorded and will be available. The slides will also be available on the Beacon website. Um, now I'd like to um, 
open it up for questions. We have a few on the side already. If you have some questions, please um, type them in in that Q&A box on the bottom right. Um, for the first question, um, please discuss um, sac sacramoid bladder cancer cells frequency and prognosis. I'm going to have Donna, I mean Dr. Hansel, will you take this one on? Yes, yeah, so sarcomatoid bladder cancer is one of the variants um, or one of the subtypes of urothelial carcinoma. And that's the most common, uh, urothelial carcinoma is the most common form of bladder cancer. Um, and for most people, unless you've heard something different, that, you know, generally the category is here. Sarcomatoid urothelial carcinoma is a very uncommon subtype. Um, that tend to have a very specific appearance where the cells look really long and stringy. Um, we do know that there's a range um, in some tumors that have sarcomatoid of either a low amount, which is called focal, or um, a much more prominent amount, which is called diffuse. Um, and we do know that the more of that variant type you have, the more aggressive the bladder cancer tends to be. Now, that being said, there there is subjectivity in how people call sarcomatoid, um, and I tend to use very strict criteria, um, and a lot of times that will vary, you know, if people say it's just a small amount, sometimes that really can be subjective. Um, you know, there, there are cases where the whole tumor is sarcomatoid, and we worry that could be very aggressive. Um, but we also, in many cases, use our special stains to make sure it's really um, a bladder cancer and not coming from somewhere else. Okay, and I'll just thank you so much. Oh, go ahead. Vanessa, if I could just add um, a little bit of something as well, and, and Donna, if you want to comment about this. Um, when we often see as urologists a sarcomatoid tumor, um, even if it is not involving the sort of deep muscle or a T2 lesion, um, we will uh, recommend cystectomy because we know that these are very aggressive tumors with, uh, with the very high propensity for spread. Um, and it oftentimes, and we know that it's not very um, uh, amenable to intravesical therapy. So we're a little bit more um, aggressive with our treatment of these types of cancers. And, and Trinity, I would agree with that um, because these can, you know, they start to almost lose their identity as bladder cells and really kind of transform into more aggressive behaving cells, uh, which is sometimes why we have to stain these to make sure that, that they really are bladder cells. All right. Thank you both. Um, I guess building on what you had just said, Dr. Bibalacqua, for the next question, if stage has a direct relationship to metastasis, why do we often wait for high-grade TA or T1 to progress to T2 disease for cystectomy, and is there a difference in survival between early cystectomy versus treatment with BCG until or unless progression occurs? Well, that's actually a very, uh, that's a very good question. And to answer that question, we would actually have to design a trial which would, uh, where we would be asking patients that um, may never progress to T2 disease to undergo an early cystectomy is, is, how, is the way we describe it. And we would be over-treating a number of patients. And we would be potentially um, giving a patient a, a very morbid operation um, uh, and over-treating them. So what we know today is that early cystectomy is oftentimes recommended in patients that have recurrent T1 lesions that are multifocal, there's multiple areas in the bladder, that have associated carcinoma in situ and have lymphovascular invasion because we know that those are the individuals that will not be very responsive to intravesical therapy and will need um, to undergo more aggressive treatment. So the only studies that have uh, looked at the difference in survival between early cystectomy versus patients that have undergone BCG um, and then underwent cystectomy um, are all retrospective, which means we look back at various series from institutions uh, around the country or around the world and try to um, extrapolate um, uh, uh, data that is hard to compare. 
Um, and what we have learned, and once again, this is not the best level of evidence, but patients that have undergone BCG on multiple occasions and have a delay in their diagnosis will have more aggressive disease at the time of cystectomy. And those individuals that undergo early cystectomy will, will have a better overall survival. But that is, it's, uh, it's hard for me to, um, uh, uh, to interpret that data because it's, they're very different cohorts of patients and we cannot um, make any definitive conclusions by looking retrospectively. So to, that, that question is a, is a great question and it's hard for us as urologists, as pathologists, medical oncologists to counsel th those patients because um, the data is, uh, is a little murky and it's hard to interpret. Okay. Um, for the next question, can you share any interesting, revealing new information in diagnosis or treatment of small cell bladder cancer? Um, Donna, would you want to start with this one? Yeah, so we um, as pathologists have actually gotten much better at making this diagnosis in the bladder. Um, we do know that it seems like it evolves out of a preexistent uh, urothelial carcinoma or other form of bladder cancer um, based on a few molecular studies that are out there. Uh, that being said, um, what, what's interesting about that form of differentiation of bladder cancer is that it starts to share uh, molecular properties, meaning at the gene, DNA, protein level, uh, with small cell carcinomas that arise at other sites in the body, meaning the lung, um, you know, other organs, the prostate, et cetera. Um, so a lot of the, the treatment that's gone on has really focused on that sort of appearance. So if we give a diagnosis of small cell, um, irrespective of the organ it comes from, um, it tends to be treated in, I think, a relatively systematic way. Um, we do know that there are aggressive tumors, um, and, you know, we're pretty reliable now in making the diagnosis with our special stains. Okay. Um, for the next question, um, some urologists say that they treat carcinoma in situ by resecting or scraping them via TURBT. Is it is it true, or is TURBT only good for papillary lesions? Um, Dr. Bivlaco, would you like to start with this one? Sure. So. Um when we look inside of a patient's bladder, we all, it, sometimes we believe that there may be a papil papillary lesion, which is these cauliflower lesions, or it could be just red and abnormal appearing. So we oftentimes will will do a, a we we at least in my practice, I will still do a, a scraping or a resection. And the purpose of doing a resection is to be able to provide our pathologist with a um, with a, with a, a, the ability to um, um, look at the stage of the disease. So I want to give them all layers of the bladder. So we will perform a transurethral resection of a bladder tumor, even if we think it appears to be carcinoma in situ, because we know that our eye is nowhere near as good as what our pathologists see under the microscope. So um, when treating a carcinoma in situ, um, uh, I perform a transurethral resection of the tumor with, uh, in, instead of just doing a biopsy or fulguration, because I want to provide our pathologists just with uh, the best, uh, their best uh, uh, opportunity to provide us with the appropriate stage. Okay. Um, for the next question, um, do I understand you to say that TA is considered invasive? Dr. Hansel, can you take this one on? Yeah, so, so TA is one of the non-invasive categories. Um, and when we say when that A is present after, that means it's one of the papillary lesions, um, you know, high-grade papillary. Uh, the PTIS is the non-invasive flat form of high-grade disease. Um, so both TA and TIS are non-invasive. Um, it just kind of depends whether it looks more like a tree versus it looks flat on the surface. Okay. 
Um, and for the next question, I know Dr. Bivilacqua, you mentioned that mitomycin C is not given if there's perforation in the bladder. This question is, what would happen if a patient were given mitomycin C in the presence of a perforation? Yeah, if if you were given mitomycin C and there was um, a uh, there was uh, the and there was a bladder perforation or a thinning of the bladder lining. Uh, what first of all, the you would be very as as the patient, you would have a lot of pain. You would have a lot of irritation. Um, you would have potentially a lot of bleeding, and you would and it would be very uncomfortable. And and more importantly, you could have something called necrosis of the bladder, or the bladder could actually um, uh, become um, very irritated and and you would be very um, bothered by that. Oftentimes, um, if you're giving, if if that's given, uh, the patient has to be admitted to the hospital for pain control, and more importantly, there's a lot of bleeding that occurs and uh, and needs to be observed very closely. So we we are very uh, hesitant uh, given mitomycin C after a big resection of a tumor or or removal of multiple tumors for for that exact reason. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, for the next question, um, can you please talk about recurrence of bladder cancer after a radical cystectomy and what could cause the cancer to occur again, um, specifically with a neobladder? Um, Dr. Bivolac, would you like to take this one on? Sure. Um, I think this is from Matt. Um, what, uh, as if you are diagnosed with urothelial cancer, um, you, we understand uh, that this is uh, a disease that can occur anywhere in the urothelial lining of the of the genital urinary tract. So that could be in the lining of the kidneys, in the lining of the ureters, or in the bladder. So if you were to undergo a, a, a cystectomy or removal of the bladder, um, you could have a uh, recurrence of uh, cancer in the additional urothelial lining um, of the kidneys, ureter, or even the urethra. And we know that if patients have something called carcinoma in situ, um, then uh, you would, you're at higher risk of developing um, a, a recurrence or disease in, in the lining. We know that urothelial cancer is a uh, it's multifocal, and it's what we you'll hear the term panurothelial. Um, if you were to have a neobladder or even have a ileal conduit, uh, there is some thought that having a neobladder protects the urethra from having a recurrence, but not necessarily the kidneys or ureter. That's why your um, that's why your urologists uh, or medical oncologists will get CT scans and various urine tests to um, to monitor for recurrence. Okay, um, great. And for the last question, um, for CIS, is cytology and cystoscopy um, will those both identify CIS or is more needed? And this person said that two years since their TURBT and after six BCG treatments and two to three maintenance treatments, they still feel discomfort and more frequency. Is this normal? Um, um, Dr. Bivolaco, would you like to start with this one? Sure. Um, for uh, for CIS, um, there is uh, one of the things that uh, individuals often say is that they have discomfort and they have some frequency and they have some pain with urination. Um, and when we hear that, that always, uh, as urologists, we, we think that, well, maybe there could be a recurrence of disease. Um, and what I oftentimes will use is no doubt cystoscopy and cytology are good, but they're not perfect. And if someone was to um, uh, still have uh, a pers persistently abnormal cytology, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be positive for cancer cells, but could have atypical cells, um, and it still continues to have this discomfort, we'll use other molecular markers such as fish um, or other um, uh, uh, markers that are available today um, but we all but we would still continue to monitor um, uh, potential recurrences with cytology and cystoscopy and especially if there's new symptoms and once again not persistent symptoms but new symptoms that's always a red flag that there may be um, a recurrence of disease so we sort of look a little bit closer okay um. Well, I'd like to thank our, both of our panelists tonight, Dr. Trinity Bivolacqua and Dr. Donna Hansel, 
um, as you can see on the slide, we'll be having a spring series of the Patient Insight webinars focusing on treating bladder cancer for non-muscle invasive, muscle invasive bladder cancer and chemotherapy treatment. Um, so please stay tuned and thank you very much for joining us.